Today we're going to learn about how to make calculations of the amount of energy it takes to change the, sta the state of something from uh, like a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas or vice versa from condensing something from a gas down to a liquid or for, uh, freezing something from a liquid to a solid. Up until this point we've been using the equation Q is equal to MC delta T to figure out how much energy it takes to change the temperature of something but if you'll recall when something is changing state, it doesn't change temperature. If we take cold ice below the freezing point and warm it up, when it gets to the melting point, it stays there for the entire phase change. Once the ice has all been melted to water, then we can warm up the water until we get to 100 degrees Celsius, at which there's another temperature plateau while the phase change is occurring. And once it's all been changed to gas, we can then warm up the gas uh, water. And we'll see a similar thing if we were to condense steam down to water and then freeze the water into ice, that there would be the same temperature plateaus at 100 degrees and at 0 degrees. At this point, it's worth mentioning that the temperature plateau for the state change from a solid into a liquid, this uh, plateau down at 0 degrees is much smaller than the plateau up at 100 degrees where we change from a liquid into a gas. Uh, that takes a much longer time. And we'll learn about that more. We'll learn more about that in just a minute here. So you can't use Q equals M C delta T to figure out how much energy is involved in a phase change. The reason is because there's no temperature change. If delta T is zero, that whole equation blows up. And so we need a different idea. The two terms that we're going to use in order to make these calculations are the heat of fusion, which is the energy it takes to melt or to freeze. Uh, something that to make that phase change and then we have the heat of vaporization which is the energy involved in vaporizing or condensing something. We'll start with the heat of fusion. Sometimes you'll also see it uh, called the molar enthalpy of fusion or the latent heat of fusion. It depends on which textbook you're looking at and whether it's a physics textbook or a chemistry textbook but they all mean about the same thing. It's really the amount of energy it takes to freeze or melt a mole of something and so um, it is uh, going to be a positive or a negative number depending on which phase change you're doing. What you got to stop and think about is are these processes exothermic or endothermic? And this is where thinking about exothermic being warm and endothermic being cold will get you in trouble. So you have to be careful. When we freeze something, we remove energy from that system. We have to slow the molecules down. Therefore, that is an exothermic process. And in order to melt something, we have to put energy into those molecules and it is endothermic. That means when we are using the heat of fusion for a freezing process, that should be a negative number. And when we're doing it for melting, we should flip the sign and make it positive. Now, we're going to work with water a lot today. And we use the numbers for water because they're handy and we use them often uh, in, in calculations um, in class. But this will work for any substance, for freezing or melting. Any, any substance is going to have a heat of fusion and a heat of vaporization. For water, that heat of fusion, the heat it takes to melt or to freeze something, is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. You have to give one mole of water 6 kilojoules of energy to melt it, and you have to take 6 kilojoules from it in order to freeze it. The heat of vaporization is the same idea, only now we're talking about the phase change from liquid to gas or from gas back to liquid. It's the amount of energy it takes to vaporize or condense something. And again, condensing is a process where we have got to slow down water molecules, which remove energy from them. So that is an exothermic process, whereas vaporizing takes energy put into the system. It's endothermic. So our delta H for vaporization should be negative and for uh, and or our delta H for con condensing something should be negative and for vaporizing it we want to use a positive number to put energy in for that. Now for water that number is 40.7 kilojoules for every mole. Now we had for the heat of fusion 6 kilojoules so this is about 6 or 7 times more energy to vaporize a mole of water than it is to freeze a mole of water. Which is why if you think back to the chart we looked at in the very beginning why the temperature plateau at the freezing point is much smaller is because it takes less energy to make that phase change. It takes six or seven times as much energy to, to vaporize the same amount of water. And so we see a larger plateau up with the phase change from liquid to gas. Now, people often get these confused with the specific heat. And they're similar ideas, but they're, but they're, they're different as well. Let's take a look at the units to see what the differences are. Specific heat is the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of a, one gram of something by a degree Celsius. And the heat of fusion is the amount of energy it takes to change the state of a mole of something. Now, in order to compare these things, if we look at the numerators, they're both units of energy, although one is joules and the other is kilojoules. We both have energy in the numerators. 
On the bottom, we have a bigger difference, though. On the bottom, for specific heats, we have grams, degrees Celsius. Per one gram, one degree Celsius. And for the uh, heat of vaporization and fusion, we've got moles in the bottom. That's because there is no temperature change going on during vaporization or during, um, during melting and freezing, boiling and condensing. So it's just the amount of energy per mole to do the phase change. So we're going to do some calculations um, using these new, uh, these, using this new knowledge. And so what we need to do is just jump right in with both feet and do the worst kind of problem we can do, a five-step problem. Here's the question. How much energy is required to turn 36 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius into steam at 150 degrees Celsius? This is going to require five different steps. First, we need to heat up the ice to the melting point, zero degrees. Then we're going to calculate the energy it takes to melt that ice and change it into liquid water. Then we need to do all the energy to warm up that water to 100 degrees, the boiling point. Then we need to calculate how much energy it takes to change that water into steam. And then finally, we need to warm the steam up to the finishing temperature of 150 degrees. When we take the sum of each of those five steps, we'll get the energy used for the entire process. So let's get started. The energy it takes to heat up ice to the melting point. We're starting at negative 20 degrees Celsius, so we have to go plus 20 degrees up to zero. And we're talking about solid ice here, not liquid ice. A trick is uh, that you have to watch out for is that solid ice, liquid water, and steam each have a different specific heat. And that's true for most substances. And so what we need to do is make sure that we're using the correct one. For ice, the specific heat is 2.03 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So we get out our good buddy Q is equal to MC delta T because we have a temperature change going on here. We have the mass, the t a specific heat, and the temperature changes plus 20. We calculate the to warm up the ice from negative 20 to zero is going to take 1,460 joules. Our next step is that we need to change this ice now that's at zero degrees Celsius into water at zero degrees Celsius. For that, we have to use the heat of fusion because we're not going to change temperature. Temperature is going to stay at zero. The heat of fusion for water is 6.01 kilojoules per mole, and we're going to leave that as being a positive number because this is going to be melting, so it's an endothermic process, and we want to use a plus 6.01 kilojoules. We have 36 grams of water, so we need to know how many moles of water that is. Recall that water has got a molar mass of 18.02 grams per mole, so 36 grams is essentially 2 moles of water. So if we have 2 moles of water, and it takes 6 kilojoules to melt 1 mole of water, it's going to take us 12 kilojoules of energy to melt six to, to melt two moles of water, 36 grams. The next step is now we have water at zero degrees Celsius, and we need to warm it up to water as 100 degrees Celsius. So we can go back to our good buddy Q equals MC delta T, and plug in the specific heat for liquid water now, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and the temperature change is going to we're going to go up 100 degrees. So we have 15,100 joules. Now we're at the phase change from a liquid into a gas, and so in order to do that, we're going to use the heat of vaporization, and since we are vaporizing it, it's going to be a positive number, plus 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So we have two moles still, and at 40.7 kilojoules per mole, it's going to take 81.4 kilojoules of energy to change this liquid water into gas water. Now we have the last step. Let's warm up the steam 50 degrees to 150 degrees using our friend Q equals MC delta T. Uh, the specific heat for steam is 2.01 kilojoules, 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. And so we are going to plug all our numbers in here. We're going plus 50 degrees and calculate that it will take 3,620 joules of energy to increase the temperature of steam 50 degrees. Now, if we take each of those five numbers and add them together as is, we get a problem. If you look carefully there, our units don't match up. We have kilojoules and joules, so we need to change either joules into kilojoules or change the kilojoules into joules. I want to argue that it's easier to change two things than to change three things. So let's change the kilojoules into joules. When we do that, we get similar units, and we can now add them up and see that it will take 113,580 joules to complete this uh, transformation from 36 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius to 36 grams of steam at 150 degrees Celsius. Now, like I said, this is the most complicated problem you can be expected to do 
like this. On a lot of cases, you'll be asked to do two or three steps where you're warming up something through just one phase change. A five-stepper is the most steps that you can possibly get out of these things. If you can do this five-stepper and follow it, you should have no problems doing any of the other ones.